shall we start now? Sure. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this precious time that you have given to us. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you because you are so gracious to us. And Lord, we are so thankful for this very moment that um, we can approach your throne and yeah, just talking about you, um, studying your words and also like minister it into our hearts. Um, Lord, we pray that whatever we discuss tonight, Lord, help us to understand it to it and also yeah just apply it into our life so that lord um your power will be evident to us that your words uh, is transforming lives and also we pray for um teacher dane as he is leading us to this bible study lord we pray that you bestowed wisdom on him um knowledge understanding uh, through your words and so that we'll be enlightened by what you are trying to tell us through Teacher Dane. Lord, we thank you for this fellowship. And Lord, we pray that we will have a good interaction and also um, we will have a good, um, yeah, a good sharing towards one another. Thank you, Lord, for this time. It's all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lisa. Amen. Okay, so tonight we are in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 11. Uh, so we've titled this the Old and New Commandment. Last week we saw verses 3 to 6, where we saw that obedience is a central concept in intimate fellowship. When we are in intimate fellowship with God, which is what is the claim when we say that we know him, uh, then we are obedient to him. And how we know that we are being obedient to him is when we are imitating Christ, when we are loving mankind, loving our brothers in Christ, and loving God. Um, yeah. You're cutting yeah. off. Oh, I'm cutting off? Okay. Let me... Hello. No, that's okay. Let me check my internet. Internet should be good. Okay, let's try again. Okay, all of you are paused. Okay, can you can you hear me, yeah. Janet? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now. Okay. So last week we saw that our intimate relationship with God, our fellowship with God is, uh, is strengthened, but also contingent on our obedience. Because when we are not in a relationship of obedience with God, then we are not uh, in fellowship with him, heeding the Holy Spirit as it speaks to us or heeding the word as we study and understand it. Uh, so obedience is necessary for fellowship with God. And just like Jesus Christ was obedient to the will of God in loving mankind and his fellow believers, or those who believed in him, for us, they are our fellow believers. So tonight, we're going to look at uh, our verses in two different sections, 7 to 8 and then 9 to 11. So we'll start with 7 to 8. Uh, and this verse talks about the new commandment and the old commandment. So John says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So what he's talking about here is actually the same commandment. It is not a new commandment. It's an old commandment to his readers. Those who are reading this epistle, for them, they have already heard this commandment. But in the grand scheme of God's dealing with man on earth, this is a new commandment. 
This commandment was the commandment that Jesus Christ brought to the disciples and told them that he is bringing them a new commandment. But when John is reminding his readers of this commandment, it's not a new message from John. It's an old message, the same message that Christ preached. So he's, he's saying it's not new, but in another way it is new because it was new from Christ. <clears throat> so looking at it from the perspective of the old commandment, uh, it is an old commandment which they have had from the beginning. From the beginning doesn't speak of the beginning of earth or the beginning of creation. It speaks of the beginning of the church age. There are a few different ages or dispensations which we uh, observe in scripture. When he is saying from the beginning and not in the beginning, he is speaking of the beginning of the dispensation of the church. In Genesis 1.1, he uses the phrase in the beginning, and that means at the beginning of all of creation. So this preposition here is going to be pretty important. This from the beginning speaks of the beginning of their current dispensation, which is the church. So this is a new commandment, which was new to the church, and it characterizes the stewardship responsibility of the church. So the church is responsible to this new commandment in a similar way to how the, uh, the Jews were responsible to the law of Moses. This for us is the law of Christ. This is what Jesus identified as the very heart of the law to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and body, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus identified that as the heart of the law, the meaning and the intention behind all of the rules and restrictions in the Mosaic law, which the Pharisees had missed. They were giving an outward expression of the law, but the inward heart condition had not changed. So Jesus Christ here is cutting right to the heart of the issue for the church age. And he's saying the real issue is love. Do you love God in order to obey him? And do you love mankind in order to serve them? In John 13, 34, uh, Jesus Christ gives this commandment and he identifies it as a new commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now in 1 Corinthians 7, he's going to expand, or Paul expands on this idea that just as Christ loved the church, so a husband ought to love his wife. This is another area of love in the form of service, because Paul continues to say, even laying down his life for the church. So Jesus Christ served even to the point of death. So it is the ultimate form of putting another person before your own intentions, just as Jesus Christ put God's will ahead of his, ultimately, and God's will, he put mankind ahead of himself, and he died for their sins. So this isn't a commandment that we need to go find someone to die for, uh, but to emulate Christ's character in serving each other. Another example we can look to is from the Gospel of John, where Jesus Christ washes the feet of his disciples. Remember, we don't need to recreate the exact uh, situation where we go find people's feet to wash, but we recognize Christ's servant character, and we want to emulate that service towards others. In 1 John 3.11, he says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And in 1 John 4.21, he says, And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now, at this point, it's important that we look at that love and say, what kind of love is this? Because the world, which does not have God, knows a kind of love. Uh, even in the unbeliever's world, they can say, oh, I love this person or I love this person. But this is not the same kind of love that God is talking about or that 
that John is talking about, which was the message from Christ. This is a love that doesn't emanate from the hearts of mankind, but this is a love that emanates from the heart of God, that as we are filled with God's love, God's love will move through us to those around us. So we are serving with the love of God, not with the love that comes from our own hearts. Oh, Janet is having audio difficulties. Okay. Uh, Janet, can you hear me all right, or is it your audio? I think it's your audio. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, earlier, I couldn't hear any uh, what you are saying. It okay. keeps on for us, uh, you know, posting. Mm -hmm. post. Okay. Uh, is the audio okay for everyone else? I think we're good. I think Janet has a problem with her uh, with her audio because I when I when I called her earlier, she has a problem too. Okay. So, yeah. No problem, Janet. I'm I'm recording onto my computer, not online. So the recording is going to have good audio. Um, so when I post it, you'll be able to catch up whatever you missed. Okay. Good. Uh, so this love that uh, that John is talking about here which he was commanded from Jesus Christ, this is not a love that we have to create. It's not a love that we have to produce from inside of us. This is a love which God will produce through us, through the Holy Spirit. In Galatians, we read of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, we often memorize those as kids. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. These are all uh, things which it's not our responsibility to create or produce or muster. Rather, these are the products of fellowship, that when we are in fellowship with the Spirit, when we are walking in the light, these are natural fruits which are born through the Spirit, not through us. These aren't fruits of the good Christian. These are fruits of the Spirit. It's the product of the Spirit. Uh, we can think of the difference between a vegetable garden and an apple orchard or any kind of fruit orchard. Vegetable gardens, we have to tend continually. We have to weed them. We have to water them. We have to make sure they're producing their vegetables. God does not use the analogy of a vegetable garden when he speaks of the fruit of our uh, Christian service. He uses the analogy of a tree, just like the tree in the garden that would provide mankind with food this does not need our careful tending. Yes, we do need to be observant of it, but we are not the ones curating this fruit. The spirit curates this the fruit through obedience. So when we are obedient to God, the spirit creates love in our hearts. So our first duty is to love God in obedience and in walking in the light of the Holy Spirit and his word. In that way, love will be produced uh, by the Spirit through us. When we are abiding in um, the vine, the branches bear fruit. All right, so our next verse, verse 8, he says, On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you. Now, this is going back to the heart of what Jesus Christ was teaching his apostles. He's saying, this is a new commandment to the church in general. And it is true in him and in you. This new commandment is true in Jesus Christ, and it is true in us. Remember, we are to emulate Christ's character, emulate the service attitude of Christ in obedience to God, because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. So here's looking at this commandment of love as a new commandment. Uh, what does it mean that the darkness is passing away and light is already shining? What it does not mean is it does not mean somehow that the kingdom of God is progressively growing throughout the church. That's not what this is saying. But some people look at this and think that this means that God's kingdom on earth is growing from a mustard seed into a mustard tree. That's out of context here. What he's talking about 
is the love that Jesus Christ produced in us, which was his love toward us and dying for us. We're looking here at the church, not the kingdom, where it's the true church of Christ as a microcosm of the kingdom that will be in the next age. So let's look at a couple of verses, and then we're going to look at a diagram about how that works. So in Romans 13, 12, he says, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So Paul uses this analogy of night and day. Now we do have dawn and dusk, which kind of bridge the gap. But we look at this in Paul's writing as very black and white. Either it is night or it is day. So the day isn't growing progressive throughout the night. That means the kingdom is not growing progressively throughout the night. But we are coming closer to the point where it becomes day. When it becomes day is at Christ's return. So he is saying that even throughout this church age, it's night, but the night is almost gone. In 2 Peter 1.19, we read that, so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, so as a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Peter is talking about the prophecies which he says earlier in this chapter where he's talking about the first coming of Christ and he says essentially just like we can trust all of the first prophecies about his first coming in the same way all of the prophecies speaking about his second coming are made sure because the first ones were uh, were fulfilled literally the second ones will be fulfilled literally. So just as sure as he has come, he will come again. So we as the church are to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. We see the sure word of prophecy, which promises that Christ is coming again. And this promise is our lamp shining in a dark place. And that dark place is our current world, where Christ is a light shining in this world. Whereas the person of Christ was not a light shining in the world prior to Christ's advent. In John 1, 9, we see there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So how does this work exactly? Before Christ came the first time, we had darkness in uh, John's gospel, verse 5, we read, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This speaks of Jesus Christ coming to earth and presenting this new message and then dying for uh, mankind so that they might be redeemed to God. What he is saying here is Jesus Christ came as a light and it entered into a dark situation. The world was in a dark situation prior to Christ. During the church age, this is the verse that we just read before, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. This is the present situation in the church. There is still darkness. The darkness has not yet passed away. But shining in that darkness, which is present during the church age, is the true light of Jesus Christ. Now we can be enlightened through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God made sure through his fulfilled prophecies, his fulfilled promises, and also the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. We look at that in the past tense. It's historical. We know that our salvation is made sure by the death of Jesus Christ. And then we can look forward to the kingdom. Now, this is the promises that God has given to Israel, essentially since the beginning of uh, the dispensation of promise all the way back with Abraham. But we see it very clearly detailed for us in Isaiah. And then we see it again in, in Revelation 22. But in Isaiah 60, verse 19, he says, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. 
Now, this is speaking very much of literal day, literal sun, and literal light, whereas what we looked at before was figurative light, where Jesus Christ is figuratively light, uh, and light meaning illumination on the hearts of mankind, or truth. This verse means both. It's both the literal light, but it is the light of the glory of God, where the figurative uh, word picture that he uses on this earth because we can't fully comprehend the glory of God. The glory of God in the kingdom will be so foundational, so sure, so complete that its spiritual sense is translated into the physical sense where the glory of God will not just be a dim light shining through the church, it will be in its full glory with the presence of Christ ruling on this earth. Isaiah 9 uh, speaks of Jesus Christ as the, uh, the ruler um, who is to come with the government on his shoulders, that he'll rule with a rod of iron. Uh, that is the day that we look forward to where Jesus Christ is present and the true light um, is shining. So that is what it means when it says that the darkness is passing away and the light um, is already here, and that's Jesus Christ. But his, his ministry as king is yet to come in the future. All right, our second little group of verses here from 1 John 2, uh, verses 9 to 11. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this is very familiar to the verses we've already seen in 1 John, where we saw that the one who is, he says he's walking in the light but walks in darkness is a liar. The one who uh, says he loves God but is, of course, says he is obedient. What was that? Uh, who says he doesn't sin, but does sin, is a liar. Uh, so here we see that the one who says he loves his brother, and yet he hates his brother, is a liar. So the, But the one who loves his brother abides in the light. So remember that word abiding is one that is characteristic of fellowship. When we are abiding in Christ, resting in Christ, like the branches on the vine. So we've got a lie and a truth here. We have a false claim, which is the one who says he's in the light, and a truth claim, the one who loves his brother. So the one who loves his brother is actually walking in the light. But if you are holding uh, contentions against your brother, you're not walking in the light. Now notice this says his brother. It doesn't say a brother or the brother's. It says his brother. This is speaking of Christian fellowship with one another. It's not speaking of the world at large, but John is narrowing in here, not just loving and serving mankind, but specifically loving and serving your fellow Christians. Where if we are holding contentions against our fellow Christians, if we are allowing this root of bitterness to grow in the body of Christ, then we are not walking in the light of Christ. Remember, a house divided cannot stand. Jesus Christ says this when he's accused of using the power of Beelzebub uh, to produce miracles. He says, we cannot have both loyalties in one body. If we are hating one another, then we are not loyal to Christ. We are being loyal to our past state. It is no longer our true reality that we are identified with sin. It is our true reality that we are identified with Christ. Think of it this way. When you get married, you change your last name. I'm not sure if that's the same in the Philippines, but in America, uh, when a woman marries a man, she changes her last name. She takes his last name. Now, she can continue to write her maiden name, the name she had before, but it's no longer her true name. 
her true name is identified with her husband. Now, the Holy Spirit, which has baptized us into the body of Christ, has married us to Christ. We take on his name. We take on his characteristics. So if we want to produce those things which were present in our past lives before we came to know Christ through faith, then we are being disingenuous with our present state. Rather than taking on the name of Jesus Christ and letting that characterize us, we are reverting to old habits and we are acting as if we are still loyal to uh, Satan, who was our ruler before uh, Christ set us free through faith. So the one who loves his brother abides in the light. That means the one who loves his brother is resting in Jesus Christ, is taking on that new character which Christ produces in them through the Holy Spirit. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. There is no root of sin inside of him which Satan can use as a foothold to ruin his witness or to cause dissension within the body of Christ. When we are loving one another, when we are serving one another, then there is not the opportunity for division. We do not want to be dividers of the body of Christ. We want to be one with Jesus Christ as we are one with each other. In first, or in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 9 through 10, uh, John writes that Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. God's giving us a metaphor here. It's kind of a mixed metaphor. But he's saying, just as in the daytime, we need the light to see, so in the spirit, we need the light to see, otherwise we stumble. Uh, Lisa, Lisa asks, how can we tell if we are living out the world's definition of love or true biblical love? Well, let's think about that for a second. What is the world's love? Uh, one way that, uh, one very big difference about the world's love and uh, God's love is the world's love can be selfish. In fact, at the root of the world's love is always self-love. Think of uh, a husband and a wife who love each other, not in Christ, but because they have passion for one another, because they are infatuated or enamored with the other. I love you because you're good to me, is what this love says. It's a love that is not self-sacrificial. It's not a love that is serving. But then what happens when you're no longer attracted to that person, or if you are no longer uh, feeling those butterflies that you had when you first met them? At that point, you think that love can die. The love of God cannot die. The love of God is produced apart from uh, personal, uh, yeah, conditional versus unconditional. Uh, the love of the world is conditional. The, world of, the love of God is unconditional. We could say that the world's version of love has a fickle nature. It changes. The love of God is continual. It is the same in every situation. So how do we know we are loving as the Bible or loving as the world or loving as Jesus Christ? Uh, it's when we are emulating Jesus Christ. And how would we know we are emulating Jesus Christ? It's when we are staying in the word and coming to know who he is through the world word that reveals him. So it's going to be pretty difficult for us to know if we are emulating Christ, if we don't know who Christ is. And how do we know who Christ is? He revealed himself in scripture to us. In uh, 1 John 1, th 1 through 5, it says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was Jesus Christ, or and the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This word was Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the spirit of prophecy from the beginning. So 
we not only need to look to the New Testament, but to the Old Testament as well to understand what is this love of God that is so long-suffering and loving towards mankind. We want to emulate that. And how we emulate that is we look to history. We look to the Bible, God revealing himself in written word. Oh, I didn't finish this verse. Uh, so just like the light of the day allows us to see so that we can walk properly, so um, the light of the spirit allows us to see spiritually so that we can walk without stumbling. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So when we are walking in darkness, physically, at nighttime, imagine running around outside with no flashlight, no moonlight, no sunlight. We can't see, right? But when the light is uh, illuminating our path, when we are walking in the spirit, we are walking in the light, we're walking in the daytime spiritually, we have the ability to see. Now, that ability doesn't come from us, right? The sun illuminates the earth. The spirit illuminates us so that we can see. This is not our own doing, but when we are resting in the spirit, we can see through his power. So what does it mean to be blinded? It says the one who hates his brother is blinded. He is in darkness. He walks in darkness does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this goes much beyond just simple inability to see. It's not a neutral here. It's, it's a negative where not only is he unable to see where maybe he can't make things out, uh, maybe things are blurry. That's not what they're saying. It's not blurry to him. He is completely incapable of seeing spiritually. When he hates his brother, his eyes are blinded. I don't know if you've ever uh, hated anyone. I know it's, it, in the world, it doesn't sound so bad to hate, but we know from scripture that the end of hatred is murder, so that in God's eyes, he can see these as one thing, because hate is only the root that leads to murder. Cain hated his brother, and produced murder from that. This hatred can be so blinding and it's so paradoxical to the love of Christ that they really cannot exist in the same place. When we are producing hatred, the love of God cannot be produced through us. If the branch is poisoned, the branch must be cut off. This branch of hatred cannot be allowed to fester in your bodies if you are um, to be in the love of Christ. Uh, this hatred is something that we produce. We need to stop producing hatred so that the Spirit can produce fruit through us. Um, if we are poisoning the branches, the Spirit's work will not be uh, present in our branches. So let's look at some verses about that. And remember, John is using shorthand. Uh, he is trying to say a lot in very few words, so he's not repeating himself a lot. So we're going to look here to a couple other uh, writings, one from Peter or one from Paul, and then a longer one from Peter, where they're going to say very explicitly and in great detail what John is using a picture to say. So in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4, Paul writes, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, John is not writing about the gospel like Paul is writing about the gospel. He's not saying that the believer who hates his brother is actually not a believer. That's not at all what John's saying. He's saying that in the same way as Satan is able, as the ruler of this world, to blind those who are his, so when we are belonging to Christ, but we are walking in the darkness, we are acting as if Satan still has power over us. Uh, that is no longer our true character. Our true character is saved by Jesus Christ through faith alone. 
So we need to walk in that light and act like that. Otherwise, despite the fact that we're saved, we are acting like unbelievers who can be blinded by Satan. Uh, we, can, we can think of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it says that um, some will be saved, though as through fire. Uh, there will be nothing worth um, saving, but all things will be burned up um, from the works of that believer. Uh, we don't want to be the believer who is saved, though as through fire. We want to be the believer who is saved into, uh, into a future of reward, where we have gold and riches through the Holy Spirit stored up for us in heaven. Remember, those are crowns that we will cast before the feet of the Lord. It brings glory to him when we are abiding in the Spirit and um, producing or and letting the Holy Spirit produce good works through us. Um, so we don't want to act in the character that once defined us. We want to act in the character that now defines us, which is Jesus Christ. All right, in 2 Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter gives us in a much more detailed, much more, or a much less metaphorical way, exactly what John is telling us. And he's going to do it in nine verses. So let's read through these nine verses here. So Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, he is addressing believers. They are saved, just like Peter is saved. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Remember, we're talking about knowledge of Jesus Christ and God. That is having fellowship with him. Our context is if we say we know God. That's what Peter's talking about here. If we know God. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has given us the power to walk in the light. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory, and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promise, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature by the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the power he's produced for us, having escaped the corruption that is the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. Now, what he's doing is he's, he's extending from the outer experience all the way down to the core of what the fruit is of the spirit is in us. And you'll notice there are multiple fruits of the spirit in this chain reaction list. And that's because the fruits of the spirit are inseparable from one another. We can't have love, but not patience. We can't have patience, but not kindness. These are things that are all one concept. The fruit of the spirit is a singular fruit. It's not something that we can divide up and say, well, I'm good with this, but I'm not good with this. No, it, it's all the same thing. And the very core of it is that love of God in us and through us. So we need to remember that all of those fruits of the Spirit are in us because Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit produces them in us. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Our present state is purified from our sins. No matter what we do, we are held in the double grip of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Nothing can take us out of his hands. But we can destroy our witness. We can destroy our walk on earth if we choose 
not to walk in the light of Jesus Christ, which is the light that is already shining in this age. We ought to be living in our heavenly position with Jesus Christ, just as it is our true position that we are with Christ in the heavenlies, we ought to walk on this earth in full understanding and knowledge of that truth, that we have an eternal destiny with Jesus Christ, we ought to be living this life just like that eternal destiny is our present state. So what do we learn from 1 John 2 verses 7 through 11? We learn the old and new commandment, what it means. Uh, we're given some beautiful word pictures by John here. He says, obedience defines the disciple. Just as Christ was faithful to God's will, so we imitate Christ and obey God. The commandment which we are to follow was the new commandment that Christ preached, to love as he loved God and man. The commandment is not a new teaching of the apostles. It is the same message which has always characterized the church age. Uh, so we can think perhaps this uh, we know is about at least 50 years after Jesus Christ died that, that John is writing this, or 50 years after um, Jesus Christ gave this new commandment. He is saying that 50 years ago, this was the new commandment that Jesus Christ gave. I'm giving it here to you again, and now it's not new to you anymore. It's an old commandment. But remember, John is combating some false doctrines being taught in the church. So he is identifying this as an old commandment and a new commandment because there are people coming around teaching the church in the first century new commandments, which were not the old commandment, things that were different from what Christ preached. So John is correcting doctrine here, as well as reminding them, this was the message from the beginning. The apostles are not changing it. You shouldn't listen to any man who is changing it. The brother who loves is in the light. And just like real light, he is able to see only by its illumination. Without it, he falls. So we want to be walking in the light of Christ, which is abiding and resting in him, uh, being obedient to the spirit as it teaches our heart, as it trains us to walk like Christ, but not neglecting the study of the word where we come to know Jesus Christ intimately through his revelation of himself. All right, so that is um, our study tonight. Are there any questions or comments or prayer requests? <laughs> Anyone? No, me, no. I'm just uh, amazed for you know the thoughts, the enlightenment of what you just said. Uh, you know, uh, explaining about those words. So it makes yeah learning. You know. Learning, okay. yeah. <laughs> Learning. No, I, I, I love those verses by Peter from his second letter. Uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 I wrote them down again and again and again, studying for this. And it's, it's just amazing to see the progression that he is whittling it down, down, down. And you see that at the core of it is love. Uh, I have a really good uh, little chapter in a book about the love of God. Um, I, I can send that to you guys through, um, through our messenger if you want to read it. It's not too long, but it talks about the love of God and how it's, how it's produced through God and not through us and how it's different from the world. Uh, so I, I can definitely send that. It's, it's by Lewis Ferry Chafer um, from his book, He That is Spiritual. Oh, happy to read that. Um, I, just la I just want to add, like, I love how you emphasize the love of God mm -hmm. in this um in this topic. Um, like as as Lisa said, like how do we define like if we are living in uh in godly uh, in godly love rather than the worldly love? Because sometimes we are mixed up with with like conditions and unconditional, and yeah, it's like. Um, the way I, uh, you know, the way I understand about the the love of God is like immeasurable, 
And yeah, sometimes we as a human being, we fall into that kind of yeah, conditional love. It's because I think we are like, you know, uh, we are limited and yeah, I am enlightened, like how we could abide in, in the love of God rather than the love of the world. Like, you know, kind of like uh, seeking validation on what is in the world rather than you are, uh, rather than knowing that you are already validated in God's love. So, yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's wonderful clarification. I think that's a good succinct way to put it. So thank you, Risa. You're uh, welcome. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what John is teaching here, that the love of God is something unique, something distinct. And uh, I mean, this world would probably even allow us to be haters of other people, but still look at our us as loving. Uh, because ultimately what this world is concerned with is self-love, self-magnification. And uh, we can look back all the way to, to the Garden of Eden and see that that was, well, in Ezekiel, we see that that was the sin of Satan, that um, he magnified himself in his mind above God. Um, but also uh, Eve chose or was deceived and thought that she herself could become like God. Um, this is failing to love God for who he is. And in Romans 1, uh, it says that knowing the truth, we've chosen a lie. Um, we have not worshipped God the creator, but chosen instead to worship the creation. And I think it's easy to forget that we ourselves are creation. So we don't need to be worshiping the earth or worshiping the stars to worship creation. If we are loving ourselves more than we are loving God, uh, then we are worshiping the creation. If we are self-serving and not God-serving, uh, then we are serving the creation. But another thing, and this one is a little more sensitive, I think. People who are going out to Africa and serving the, the people of Africa, um, giving them food and giving them water. You know, if they are not doing this through the love of Jesus Christ, then it is a self-serving effort. If it is not God producing this love for man in them, then it is creation worship. Uh, we are uh, worshiping the creation. And at the core of that is self-service because we are trying to make ourselves feel better about our lost condition rather than turning to Jesus Christ, who is the only remedy for our lost state as unbelievers. So it is a denial of Christ. And that's, that's something that the world does not accept. They do not see the benevolence of mankind in the world's um, definition of what is benevolent. They can't comprehend how the Bible doesn't see that and give um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm walking in circles here. I think you guys get what I'm saying that even a good person by the world standards is acting selfishly, is not loving God because the only way to produce godly love is abiding in God. So the unbeliever is incapable of producing love of any true sort. Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, in addition with that, like, you know, like self-validation, mm -hmm. I think um, I like, I like how you, how you emphasize also, like when John teaches the, the right gospel, because nowadays I, I think there are a lot of like, you know, more on motivational speeches or motiva uh, motivational, you know, speaker that trying to promote a uh, loving self rather than loving God and, I think in that kind of like in that kind of you know um, speeches, I feel like people are drawn to be like you know more selfish. And even though they are Christians, uh, there are kind of sense that they are focusing on themselves rather than rather than God. So I'm not saying that I am not doing it, but yeah, I think it is for in general in general term. I've encountered those kind of things. And for me, it's kind of like off 
when I heard this kind of preachers doing those things. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. And Lisa just wrote, uh, true love is fueled by God's supernatural love. True love is self-giving love. For me, it is more concerned about giving than receiving. It is more concerned with the welfare of others than self. Exactly. I mean, think of a mother and a child. Mm. Um, that mother's love for her child is self-sacrificial. Jesus Christ's love for us was self-sacrificial, even to the point of death, coming to this earth in order to die on our behalf. Uh, we, if we are to emulate Jesus Christ's love, it's to let that love that is self-sacrificial flow through us from the Holy Spirit. Um, so when the Holy Spirit asks us to, uh, to love one another, that's what it's speaking about. Just one second. Okay. You are muted, Lisa. <laughs> All right. So, are, are there any more questions or comments or prayer requests? I, I have prayer request. Okay. Still, I, 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 I my prayer request is uh, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is good. Solomon prayed for wisdom. Remember that, and God gave it to him. Yeah. Um, all right, and Nita has asked that we pray for the world that we may find love for every day, living for the better world to live in. Uh, I think for me, uh, also include my uh, uh, driver written test. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be on August, but yeah, please pray for me that I could study very well. And yeah, we'll go through it. And pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> and can pass the test and so on. Yes, you can pass the test. Very good. Yeah. All right, well, I will close us in prayer then, and then you guys can go get some sleep. Uh, all right, so <laughs> dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the Holy Spirit, which you have given to us, that through the Holy Spirit, uh, we might uh, be vessels of your fruit, that uh, you shining your light through us as this dim light of the church that points towards Christ's coming again, Lord, we pray that you help us to be that light to the world. We know that we ought to be walking in the light, and unless we are doing so, we are incapable of being a light. So, Lord, we, we pray that you use us uh, faithfully in service for your word. And, Lord, we pray for this world that it might come to find the love of Jesus Christ. We know that sadly many will perish in the darkness, but for as many as you have appointed to light, Lord, Help them to find it and to rest in that light. That their Christian service might be characterized by Christ likeness. Lord, we pray also for Lisa's written driver's test that she can study well and that she can pass that test. And we pray also for Lisa's wisdom. And uh, we, we pray for wisdom for all of us that we can rightly divide the word of truth, understand who you are through the word and how you've revealed yourself and in walking in the spirit. Uh, we pray that none of us are quenching the spirit, that when we are convicted of something by, uh, by our knowledge of Jesus Christ in the word and the spirit that is convicting us from within, we pray that they are allowed to communicate properly through us and to us that we can understand and abide um, in the word and in our fellowship with Jesus Christ and God the Father. Lord, we ask these things in your glorious name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dane. Thank you, I'll see Thank you, you guys. Dane, for your time. Not seven days. Next Friday. Yes. Thank you. Have a good All day, right. everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.